my name is Dan Slagle. I serve as the care and missions pastor here at Faith Bridge. And today we're continuing in our sermon series, Courageous, a look at the life of Joshua. We're going to be in the book of Joshua again, ver- uh, chapter 6 and 7. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. Our ushers are coming down the aisle. They'll be glad to give you one, and that can be yours to keep. Joshua, as we have been talking about, is uh, primarily a book of conquest. The Israelites uh, were led to freedom by Moses, Joshua's predecessor. And under Joshua's leadership, they crossed over the Jordan River and into the promised land, the land that God had set aside for this new nation to settle and to grow. But there was one big problem. The land was already occupied occupied by uh, a large number of nations and tribes collectively known as the Canaanites. And the Canaanites, by any measure, were among the most evil, wicked people that ever lived. Uh, Terribly violent, practiced things like child sacrifice and other abhorrent uh, rituals and practices. And so God was going to use the Israelites to move them out and give Israel a place to settle. Now, uh, last week we learned that their first big opponent was Jericho. And as they prepared for the battle with Jericho, God had some explicit instructions for them. And I want to read to you uh, one in particular that's found in Joshua chapter 6, beginning in verse 18. God said to them, But keep away from the devoted things, so that you will not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you will make the camp of Israel Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into His treasury. In other words, God is saying, when you go in and begin to conquer the city of Jericho, don't touch the plunder. That's not for you as individuals to take and keep. Rather, all of the plunder is to be devoted, the devoted things it is called, devoted to the Lord and will go into his treasury. Otherwise, you as a nation are opening yourself up to, do, uh, to destruction. So don't touch those things. Well, as we learned last week, They were victorious over Jericho, and it was an amazing victory that God brought about. The walls falling down and uh, being able to claim that portion of the promised land. And the next opponent to come was the city of Ai, Ai. And this uh, really should have been a relatively easy victory because Ai was much, much smaller than Jericho, an insignificant army to battle. Israel had every confidence that they were just going to go in and clean up with no problem at all. Unfortunately, things didn't turn out that way. In fact, just the opposite happened. I was completely victorious over Israel to the point that they had them running away. And Joshua, as the leader of the Israelites, was beyond dismayed. He falls on his face before God and he begins to cry out, Lord, what has happened? You promised to be with us. You promised to go before us. You promised to provide victory, that this land would be ours. Have you forsaken us? Have you left us? What is going on? And in chapter 7, God answers that prayer. And we pick up with God's answer beginning in verse 10. The Lord said to Joshua, stand up. What are you doing down on your face? Israel has sinned. They have violated my covenant, which I commanded them to keep. They have taken some of the devoted things. They have stolen. They have lied. They have put them with their own possessions. That is why the Israelites cannot stand against their enemies. They turn their backs and run because they have been made liable to destruction. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy whatever among you is devoted to destruction. Go, consecrate the people, tell them. Consecrate yourselves in preparation for tomorrow, for this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, that which is devoted is among you, O Israel. You cannot stand against your enemies unless you remove it. 
In the morning, present yourselves tribe by tribe. The tribe that the Lord takes shall come forward clan by clan. The clan that the Lord takes shall come forward family by family. And the family that the Lord takes shall come forward man by man. He who is caught with the devoted things shall be destroyed by fire, along with all the things that belong to him. He has violated the covenant of the Lord and has done a disgraceful thing in Israel. Early the next morning, Joshua and Israel, uh, Joshua had Israel come forward by tribes, and Judah was taken. The clans of Judah came forward, and he took the Zarahites. He had the clan of the Zarahites come forward by families, and Zimri was taken. Joshua had his family come forward man by man, and Achan, son of Carmi, the son of Zimri, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, was taken. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give him the praise. Tell me, what have you done? Do not hide it from me. Achan replied, It is true. I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what I have done. When I saw the plunder, a beautiful robe from Babylonia, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. They are hidden in the ground inside my tent with the silver underneath. So Joshua sent messengers and they ran to the tent and there it was, hidden in his tent with the silver underneath. They took the things from the tent, brought them to Joshua and all the Israelites and spread them out before the Lord. Then Joshua, together with all Israel, took Achan, son of Zerah, the silver, the robe, the gold wedge, his sons and daughters, his cattle, donkey, and sheep, his tent, and all that he had to the valley of Achor. Joshua said, why have you brought this trouble on us? The Lord will bring trouble on you today. Then all Israel stoned him, and after they had stoned the rest, they burned them. Over Achan they heaped up a large pile of rocks, which remains to this day. Then the Lord turned from his fierce anger. Therefore, that place has been called the Valley of Achor ever since. <clears throat> no doubt, uh, this story strikes our modern sensibilities as rather extreme. But I think we need to understand that Israel was in an extreme situation. Achan had committed sins, some rather obvious, some not so obvious, but all of them were having an impact on the entire nation of Israel. On the obvious side, he had broken three of the Ten Commandments. He had coveted, he stole, and he lied. On the not so obvious side, he had become a traitor to the nation of Israel. You say, how, how so? Well, God had made clear, if any of you does this, if any of you claims the plunder for himself, you've opened yourself up to destruction. I won't be with you anymore. And so in essence, by becoming a thief, he had imperiled the entire nation. He essentially had gone over to the other side. And so extreme measures were necessary. If you think about it, even today, we take rather extreme measures against those who commit traitorous behavior as well. Achan had done a grievous evil, as the Lord said, and the entire nation of Israel could have paid the price for it. Underneath his individual sins really is one foundational sin, and that is a lack of integrity. You know, in integrity is, is that, it's that thing about being whole, undivided, honest, sincere, right to the core, truthful in every way. Not one person in one situation and another person in a different situation, but being the same person all the way through, honest and true. One author has said that integrity has to do with um, how you behave when no one else is looking. That really is the test of integrity. And it was precisely at this point where Achan failed, when no one else was looking. I can uh, imagine what was going on, the battle scene there in Jericho. He's engaged in battle with all of the other troops, and then he stumbles upon 
this robe and this silver and gold. And I have to think that after observing it there, he probably took a moment and looked around. Nobody, uh, okay, I think I'll just set this aside for myself. Carried it home and buried it under his tent. Got away with it, clean. Nobody was the wiser, or so he thought. But you know, our sins always have a way of finding us out. The next battle didn't go the way it was supposed to. And suddenly, everyone is wondering, what is happening? And when God assembles the nations by tribes, clans, families, individuals, it comes right down to Achan. I'll give him this much. When Joshua asked him, when he confronted him, told him to confess, he, he told everything. He told the whole sad story. And I think if we'll pay attention to what he said, there are some important lessons that we can learn about what not to do, about how we can be people of integrity by refusing to go down the same path that Achan chose to go down. And he tells his story uh, by beginning with the words, when I saw, when I saw the plunder, when I saw the robe and the silver and the gold. Now, in the Hebrew, the word saw there is not a glance. It's not merely noticing, oh my goodness, look, there happens to be some silver and gold. No, that word saw in the Hebrew is a gaze. It's giving your undivided attention to some. It's getting focused on something. It has captured your vision so that you're really not paying much attention to anything else. And that is the first step toward losing our integrity. When we begin to focus on the wrong things, when we begin to pay attention to the wrong things, Apparently, Achan did not understand the principle that whatever has your attention has you. So I wonder today, what has your attention? What, what is it that you find yourself coming back to over and again in your mind? Is it something that is building up your integrity, that is strengthening your honesty, your devotion, your commitment to the Lord, or... Are you coming back again and again and again to something that's tearing down your integrity and putting distance between you and the Lord? What is it that has moved from sight to the center of your heart? It's so important to pay attention to what we're paying attention to. Because that is the first step. That, that is what sets the trajectory for everything that's going to come next. When I was uh, 18 years old, as many of our guests are here today, about 40 years ago, man, that sounds like a long stinking time. I did one of the dumbest things that I have ever done in my life, and, and that's saying something. When I was 18, I allowed some of my so-called friends to talk me into going to see an X-rated movie. Now, I knew as soon as I got in the... Here's... Uh, do a little dating of, of myself. It, back then, if you were going to indulge in that kind of behavior, you had to go to a theater, and I knew as soon as we got in the car to go, I was doing the wrong thing. I mean, my conscience was already working on me, saying, what are you doing? Why, why, are, why, are, you, why are you doing? You know you shouldn't be doing this, but I didn't want to lose face. I didn't want to come off as you know, a chicken or the one who wasn't going to be cool enough to go or whatever. And so I stay in the car. But all the while, my conscience and the Holy Spirit are just hammering me, saying, you shouldn't be doing, you should not be doing this, right up to the point that I'm seated in the theater, and the opening credits begin to roll, and I am desperate at this point. I mean, I, I just, I, I didn't know what else to do, and so in my heart, I cried out, I said, God, 
You've got to get me out of this. And I kid you not, within three seconds, pow, lightning struck the theater. (laughs) Fried the projector. They had to give everybody their money back. I was like, thank you, Lord. I was the only happy customer there were... (laughs) 200 other furious ones. I didn't own the fact that I was responsible for the lightning, but I sure was glad that it came. God was reinforcing in my mind, Dan, it matters what you pay attention to. It matters what you pay attention to because that is setting a trajectory for what comes next. And what came next for Achan was that he began to covet Now, that's not a word that we use much anymore, but basically it refers to an overwhelming desire. It's like new car fever on steroids. You can't think about anything else. This is something that you must have. You can't stop thinking about it. Your mind rolls right back around to it. It's what Tim Keller calls uh, imagination inflammation. The thing that we're coveting takes on huge proportions, much bigger than it really is. It just becomes big in our mind to the point that we can't think about anything else. And the really dangerous part about coveting is that if we stick with it long enough, we will begin to take unbelievable risks, just like Achan did. We will risk our reputation, our livelihood, our safety, our family. We will risk even our own lives as Achan did and ultimately lost. And it's all for a lie because the way that the devil uses coveting is to blow something out of proportion. It's never what it claims to be. That's why new car fever goes away the moment you drive off the lot. It's not all that it was cracked up to be. Nothing ever is. What is your mind circling back to? It's not just a matter of what you're looking at with your eyes. It's what's going on in your mind and in your heart. And when your mind is free and you're not focused on work or a project or on anything else in particular, where does your mind drift? That's a pretty good indicator of what you may be coveting. And once you get in the place of coveting and your covetousness and your conscience get into a battle back and forth, coveting is going to win almost every single time. It's very difficult to back out at that point. And it's at that point that Achan stepped over the line. You know, right up until then, he had every opportunity to walk away, looking at it, coveting it. Still, he could have left. But because he stayed focused and because he let his desire grow and grow and grow, there came the point where he stepped over the line and he confessed, I took it and I hid it. And that's when his integrity was gone. And that's when the nation of Israel was in trouble. So far as Achan knew, it was all good. Nobody else had seen it. Ran home, buried it. He really thought that by putting these things, you know, under about a foot of dirt and beneath his tent, all would be okay but he underestimated God and he underestimated the power of sin and its ability to impact our lives. Is there anything in your life that you feel the need to hide? Is there any sort of behavior in your life that you wouldn't want anybody else to know about? Are are you looking at anything that you wouldn't want shown on these screens? Is there a person 
that you're becoming more and more infatuated with who isn't your spouse? Is there a way of making easy money that isn't right, but it's becoming increasingly appealing as the days go by? You know, the devil comes at us all sorts of directions. And Aiken's story ends on the saddest possible note. He had to die so that the rest of the nation of Israel would not die. And the writer finishes Aiken's story by saying, and they buried him and heaped a pile of rocks over his bones, which are there to this day. Friends, let's learn from Achan because our lives don't have to go in that direction. You see, there was someone else in Scripture who was also tempted, tempted in an infinitely greater way than Achan ever was. In Matthew chapter 4, we're told that Satan took the Lord Jesus to a high peak and showed him the kingdoms of the world. Commentators say that what Aiken stole in modern day dollars amounts to about 30,000 bucks. So it wasn't chump change, but compared to the kingdoms of the world, no comparison. And he said to Jesus, you can have all of this if you will just bow down and worship me. But what does Jesus do? Well, for one thing, he didn't even look at it. Scripture says the first thing out of his mouth was, away from me, Satan. I'm not even going to look at it. I'm not even going to pay attention. Get out of my sight. Jesus was smart enough to know what we're looking at matters. And so he didn't allow himself even to look at it. And furthermore, he let Satan know in no uncertain terms, if I'm going to covet anything, it's not going to be these kingdoms. I'm going to covet God. I want more and more of God. My affections are set on Him. My heart is set on Him. My love is growing daily for Him. I know that what you're putting before me is an illusion. It's a lie. But I know that my God is real, and so I will choose to worship and serve Him and Him alone. You know, in the recovery community, we say that the way to deal with temptation is not to resist, it's to replace And Jesus was teaching us the way to deal with the things that the world parades before us is not to try to fight, 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 but rather to replace our coveting those things with a coveting of God. You know, that's why we gather here each week, Sunday after Sunday, to learn how to covet God. We worship God to fan into flame our affections for Him. We sing his praises and we study his word and we spend time in his presence so that we learn how to love him above everything else. And then when we move out into the world during the week and it begins to throw everything under the sun at us and say, go after this, go after that, go after this, go after that, we could say, no, 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 no. I remember on Sunday who I really love and who really has my heart. And I'm going to worship him. I'm not going to settle for these other things. It's interesting some of the similarities between Achan and Jesus. Like Achan, Jesus was publicly executed. And like Achan, Jesus was executed so that everyone else could live. And like Achan, Jesus was put under a pile of rock. But there's one way they are different. The writer of Joshua says that Achan's bones were placed under those rocks and they are there to this day. But the writer of the gospel says of Jesus, he is not here for he is risen. And the way to life is not by becoming preoccupied with the things of this world and giving our heart to the things of this world. That's the way to death. But the way to life is to become preoccupied with the one who has conquered death and leads us into the way of life. 
That's what Jesus has in store for us. And that's what Jesus wants for you. Make no mistake about it, friends. We can't fool God. We can fool ourselves and we can fool other people for a while. But the scripture says God will not be mocked. Our sins will find us out. So why even put him to the test? Why even bother to go there? Here's the fact of the matter. The moment we begin to lose our integrity, it starts impacting every area of our life. If we're living a lie, we can't fully experience what it means to be married. To be married is for two to come together as one flesh. That can't happen when one is holding back with a lie. We can't know the joy of true friendship because the other person will never really know who we are. We can't know what it's like to have peace within ourselves because we're constantly looking over our shoulder wondering, will somebody find out? Will I be exposed? And we definitely can't enjoy the fullness of a relationship with God. I've been a pastor for nearly 30 years now. And it's been my observation that when people lose their integrity and begin to live a lie, they become cynical about the things of God. They find reasons not to worship God. And they begin to point out fault in the people who are at church and what the church is trying to do. Right here in our setting, yeah. There's no way that you could genuinely enter in to what we're trying to do with the Legacy Campaign. You, to practice the three R's while you're in a lie? No, I can tell you right now, the cynicism in your heart will make you say, all they want is my money. Just another scheme. That's a lie. It's a lie that the enemy keeps putting before you so that you won't pay attention to what matters. And what matters is that Jesus wants to give you life. And it's right there for the taking. And so I'd like to conclude our worship service today by spending a little time with Jesus. We're, we're going to close with an altar call. And you're going to be given an opportunity to come forward and do business with Jesus. And if there are things that he needs to put his finger on and say, this needs to change, this needs to stop, we, we want to give him an opportunity to do that. Now, I, I can hear it in my mind right now. Some of you are saying, I ain't going down there. I don't want everybody knowing I have problems. Guess what? If you've got a pulse... You got problems. There's nothing special about you if you have problems. So we just want to take some time to clear our hearts, to clean our conscience up, to let Jesus fill us with his spirit so that we can move into this week full of him. Over in the communion service right now, Pastor Ken is going to begin to provide you with leadership during this time of prayer and repentance. And here on this side, I'll extend an invitation to those of you that will come. We've got prayer partners. I'll be down here if you need someone to pray with. But uh, let's give God a chance to do with us what only God can do. Amen.